With a bit of practice, most fossils become fairly obvious to a paleontologist at first glance. You know immediately what you're looking at. When you're looking at soft-bodied fossils, though, especially things that may be new, that might be squished in all sorts of odd ways, it can be much harder. So today I want to go back to Castlebank and show you the process of trying to understand a weird fossil. We don't know for certain what this thing is yet. If it is what we think it is, it's quite exciting. But this is the, the process of discovery, warts and all. Good after morning, what's it night and anything else? Um, I can't wait to see what the auto caption does with that. Anyway, welcome back. And today we're going to be going back to Castlebank. This is this site of exceptional preservation from the Middle Ordovician, so 460 million years ago in the middle of Wales. Lots of exciting things are coming out and will be published and so on, and have been to some extent already. But um, today I want to show you something that hasn't been published and go through the process of trying to understand it. If you want certainty, this video is not for you, because there isn't any, yet. Yet again, it is one of these specimens where there is so far a single specimen, with a second one that we'll probably be able to understand a lot more. And as ever with Castlebank, it's quite small. So this is actually one of the larger soft-bodied fossils here, which is that little black dot that my finger is pointing to. So it's about yeah, three millimetres long, decent size. But luckily, we have microscopes. The first thing you see down the lens is that the sediment is quite coarse. It's got these little mica flakes everywhere. And every now and then, there's something black. This is, with hindsight and experience, the, the sign of something which is soft-bodied. I'll show you that it's just going to field of view there, a little uh, brachiopod shell, this little round silver thing. We can zoom in on that and have a closer look. This was originally a phosphate shell, but it, the phosphate has all been dissolved. I'll just put the polarizers in, brighten it. You can see the growth lines. Um, it's about a millimeter wide, but all that's left is this organic film. But it's quite a tough film. But here is something different. This is the type of preservation, this soft, dark brown to black material with weird shapes that we see when there's something soft body. We can recognize that in the field. As soon as you split the rock and it starts to darken into that sort of color, we know it's something that has to be looked at closely under the microscope. And normally in the field, we have no idea what it is. A little 20 times hand lens is just not enough to see the details. And details, there actually are though, when you start zooming in. So let's take a closer look at it. The first thing you start to notice are these sort of elongate bands, sort of bundles of black stuff running down the left side of it. They're slightly wiggly, but they're there. And based on some of the other things that we have at Castlebank, they're similar to what we see as sort of muscle bundles in various worms and well, mainly worms. Then at the left end, there's this projecting thing sticking up on the upper side, and it might just be some random gubbin. So we'll put the polarizer in, and you can then see whether there is a film of material going across it, and there is. So this is a real structure, at least a projection from it. And you follow the whole animal along, and you can see that this outline is part at the edge of a film. The other end looks a little bit fluffy. Um, it's got a sort of lumpy outline at the top there. There's not a huge amount to go on, but there is detail there. The question is, does that detail actually mean anything? We have a large box, which is labelled gubbins, of organic remains, bits of stuff that show nothing significant. They have, might have irregular outlines, they might be torn bits of something else, they might have some sort of detail to it, but there's nothing there that you can actually use. And so far what we've seen here is intriguing. There is something longitudinal, there's something sticking out, but it's not enough to go on. It's the sort of thing that you could fit into quite a large number of groups of worms potentially, and you'd never get that published and you wouldn't even try. What you need to get to that stage of actually saying that this is one of those or at least we can argue it is, is something specific. A detail that is diagnostic of a certain group. And then you try to fit 
all of the other features into the same sort of animal, or at least you see whether it's consistent with that type of anatomy. So what we need is something distinctive. And luckily there is this one feature which looks very, very intriguing indeed. Coming off the right-hand side on the upper edge, there's this little thing sticking up. It's very clearly different from the rest of the outline. And when you zoom in on it, it starts to actually have some structure to it. So you can see there is a sort of tree-like thing. It seems to have a trunk that splits into two and then divides again, possibly into very fine feathery bits that are then uh, bending backwards towards the body. And to the right of that main trunk, you can just see there is the base of what appears to be a second one. So this, but it's just out of the plane of the uh, fossil where it split. So it looks like we have a pair of structures, each of which is branching and then leading to some sort of even finer branching towards the tip. We may get more detail out of that with electron microscopy, or we may not, but until we actually have time to try it, we're not going to know. So for the moment, this is what we've got. <sighs> How many things have structures like that? You might start thinking in terms of seaweeds to start with. And certainly a little sort of branching filamentous umbrella-like structure is a possibility for seaweed. But it doesn't really make much sense of the rest of it, the form of the rest of it, or the preservation. Because we have some algae preserved at Castlebank and they are much fainter sort of grey films rather than these thick black deposits. And I say that is, tends to be more typical of, uh, of animal soft tissues. So... If not algae, then what else? Lots of things have tentacles. Not many things have branching tentacles. Very few things have a little tuft of tentacles on an otherwise relatively large body. And when they do have tentacles, in most animals, so we're thinking cnidarians and various worms, those tentacles are at the end of the animal. So you have a you know, thing like that. But in this case, it's coming off the side, close to one end, but not at it. And there's only one thing that really springs to mind when you're talking about that sort of arrangement. This is where I always think that all paleontologists should be at least a little bit of a general naturalist. Being able to know something about the animals that inhabit us you know, this world from all levels, from all phyla, is vital when you're trying to understand the details of what you're looking at when it's unfamiliar. And anyone who's been scuba diving in rock pools or just snorkeling will have come across, probably, sea slugs. Paleontologists may not have done in general because there aren't any fossils of them. They're extremely diverse in their form but the main feature that they have, or one of the features that they have, which is very distinctive, is this gill array on their backs. The number of branches varies quite a lot, and the form of them can be spectacularly varied, but, they, but it is a paired structure. So in some cases, there is just simple two branches, which then branch again, for example. What we're seeing here is perfectly within the range of what is known in nudibranx, sea slugs. If it was a sea slug, what else might we expect to see? Well, they can have all sorts of other projections. There are extensions of the digestive system, for example, that form little spikes and lobes coming off it. There is quite often um, a whole series of papillae covering the whole surface. But that's entirely variable. And one thing that is quite consistent is that it has a pair of tentacle-like structures at the front, called rhinophores. And these tend to be quite wide, short, stubby, tapered things, which are quite similar to the structure at the front end of this. Only seeing one of them, the other might be superimposed, it might be a different angle, that's assuming there are two to start with. But the shape of it is quite distinctly rhinophore-like. Then you go for these other features. So we've got these dark lines going through the middle. They look like muscles. So, do sea slugs have muscles that look anything like it? Kind of. 
Mollusks, especially snails and sea slugs, um, the gastropods, move by using a foot. This is this muscular contraption that they sort of slide along on. And that foot works by having contractile longitudinal muscles, which they pull and push in different places in order to move along. So yes, there are bundles of longitudinal muscles within the foot. That could be what we're seeing here. It's entirely possible. It fits with the morphology. And yeah, you can't rule out lots of other interpretations as well, but it's consistent. Okay, another weird thing about the fossil though is this strange fluffy margin that we have, uh, particularly around the back where it goes very faint and sort of frilly, but also around the front underneath that what looks like the rhinophore. And of course many sea slugs also have lots of modifications including this sort of the edge of the mantle which is a sort of a fringe that runs around the foot and these can also be fluffy and frilly in the same way. So it actually looks more or less like you might expect. But is that proof? Certainly not proof enough. Because aside from anything else, there are no other fossil sea slugs. Partly because they're just so soft. It's not that we don't think sea slugs existed back to, well, somewhere in the Paleozoic at least, quite possibly to the Ordovician or earlier. But it's just that we haven't found any. And so we have no information on what the ancestral forms were like, whether they were very similar to the modern ones. We don't know anything about them. So in order to make a claim of having a sea slug, you need really good evidence. One of the things you might hope to find, which is actually plausible, is the radula. So have you ever seen the marks that snails and slugs leave behind when they've been grazing algae? It's quite a distinctive sort of pattern of scrapes. And it's actually a really good way of cleaning stubborn stains on ovenware, by the way. Leave them out for the slugs. They'll appreciate it. Anyway, where was I? Yes. So they do this with a radula. This is quite a tough organic structure with rows of little spines. And radulas have been preserved in the fossil record, even in the Cambrian, when, you, when the rest of the animal has decayed and just got the little tough bits left as small carbonaceous fossils, as they're called. So it's quite possible to hope to find a radula in a specimen like this. Do we see it? No, we don't. Or do we? This is at the absolute limit of what we can see in this fossil. And I am not the slightest bit confident that that is what we're looking at here. But if you look underneath the rhinophore, at the highest magnification that we can get here, it's going a bit fuzzy because we just can't get it sharp at this magnification. But there you can see, just about, there are some little curved hooks-like structures. Are they distinct little hooks, little, uh, little curved spines? Are they arranged in the right way? Is it just my imagination? Is it something that is there but too poorly preserved to be able to see it clearly? All of the above are possible. But it's in the area where the mouth should be if that is a rhinophore. A line of little hooks like that, if they can show up, for example, in an electron microscope, would indeed be pretty good proof that this was a mollusk. And in that case, it would have to be a sea slug. So it seems that it all comes down to one tiny little detail, which is effectively a scientific prediction in that if this is a sea slug, you would expect there to be some trace of a radula. Now in Castlebank type preservation, the, the resistant soft tissues are not actually much better preserved than the very soft soft tissues. In fact, they're often paler. So it can be very difficult to predict whether you're actually going to see something or not. However, it does appear to be in the right place. And with an electron microscope, we might just be able to prove it one way or another. We might also get more detail of the possible gills on some of the other structures, these delicate little tiny projections and bobbly bits around the side, which might resolve into something actually useful. 
But I told you there would be no certainty in this one, and there really isn't. Um, it's a single specimen. It looks at first glance really difficult to do anything with at all. I suspect a lot of people, particularly some of the reviewers we might have had in the past, um, would simply have chucked this away without looking at it properly, because it doesn't look immediately striking. But there are features there. There are features that are interesting and potentially diagnostic. And you kind of nibble away at it. In the early days of paleontology, as an amateur, for example, if you've not been trained in the, the cold, hard reality of science, then you might be tempted to take an idea with this, interpret everything in that light, and run with it, and say, it's a sea slug! Ta-da! Fame and glory! Only it doesn't tend to work that way in reality, mainly because of peer reviewers, um, who are there to be the cold, hard light of reason. And that is how science works. I say that half-jokingly, but of course they are, or this process is theoretically the way in which science becomes robust. That you check your data again and again, and then somebody else checks it and sees whether you're getting carried away. So I wouldn't want to be able to publish things like this on a whim, because that's not giving you reliable answers. And science depends on reliable answers to be able to build up knowledge one layer at a time. So this is not the end of the story, I hope. One day we may get a second specimen which will either confirm or completely refute all these features that we think we see. It might show that there are a pair of these tentacles, for example. They might even show us a even without that, we might get more information from the electron microscope and be able to prove that some of these critical features are what we think they might be. And then you go from there to actually writing up a paper and trying to convince everyone else. So no, today I am not trying to convince you that this is a sea slug. What I'm trying to do is show you the process of reasoning that we go through in order to get to the point where we can be sure enough that we try to get it published. This isn't there yet. But hopefully one day it will be, and I'll be able to share the excitement with you when we discover that it really is just a blob after all. You win some, you lose some. Anyway, so um, please do stick around, and uh, if you'd like to join us on this sort of journey of discovery through not only the fossil record, but also the modern world. Because my goal really is to try to help people understand the world around them, and also the deep past of it, and how the two interconnect. So if that sounds interesting, please do subscribe, join in, um, make comments, become part of our little community, and we'll see how it goes. And I look forward to seeing you next time, and thank you for your attention. Fare thee well. <laughs>